Thanks for tuning in to the Lean 911 podcast where you'll have a voice directly from the Gemba. I will rely on my three decades of lean successes as well as my failures to answer your most challenging questions regarding your lean transformation. I'm your host, Mark Deluzio, President and CEO of Lean Horizons Consulting and the Principal Architect of the Danaher Business System. Looking forward to your questions now. Let's go to the Gemba. Well, welcome to the Lean 911 podcast. I'm Mark Deluzio, uh, President and CEO of Lean Horizons Consulting. And today we are honored to be with my friend uh, and uh, actually the son of one of my mentors, uh, uh, Hide Oba. Hide Oba is the son of Hajime Oba. This is episode 30, by the way. Uh, in episode 30, we're going to talk a little bit about your father, Hajime Oba. Uh, I've met him back in the 90s when I was developing the Danaher business system, and he helped us do that. He weighed in on, on quite a bit of uh, thought capital uh, at our co- flagship company at the time, Jake Break. Uh, and I'll tell a little bit more about that story as we go through. But Hide, you are the senior consultant with H&M Operations Management Consulting Company, and you are currently based in New York City. And uh, I'm in Arizona, so I think my weather's a little bit better than yours today. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a pleasure and honor to have you. And uh, when we met on LinkedIn, I I immediately wanted to talk to. Uh, Hide because of my association with his father and also get to know him better. So uh, we had some conversations and uh, when we get done with this particular episode, episode 30, about his father uh, and and some of the things that we learned from him, we're going to get into another episode after this, episode 31, and we're going to talk about the lean basics. And this is something, as you probably know, I've been uh, beating on for the last 30 years and uh, when when Hide and I met, we immediately you know did a what we would call a Vulcan mind melt in terms of the basics and how so many companies today are divorcing themselves from the basics. And a lot of the basics that uh, Hide learned were from his father himself, right in his own family. I mean, can you imagine that? Uh, and of course, uh, when we learn about his father, you'll find the lineage back to the originators of the Toyota production system is uh, is so rare and so precious. So, Hide, welcome to uh, the Lean 911 podcast. And maybe uh, you could tell a little bit more about yourself and, and uh, we can get talking about your dad and, uh, and uh, what a great man he was. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, and thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm very honored to talk about my father. Um, actually, yesterday was his 79th birthday, <laughs> and, and uh, it was an amazing opportunity for us to sort of reflect on, or for me to reflect on what his life was about and what happened to him. And thank you very much for this opportunity. Oh, no, but, but I, just to let the listeners know, uh, uh, Hide, uh, that would be uh, January 23rd, would be his yes. birthday. Yes, okay. Yeah. So his birthday is January 21st, and he born on 1945. So it's one zero one two three four five. No, <laughs> Don't use that on any of the security code. Anyway. See, he was doing he was doing flow way back then before he was even born. I, yeah. I mean, when he was born, that's great. <laughs> yeah, so it's easy to remember, but you know, it's not a secure secure code for sure. Don't use birthdays for sure. Um, yeah, and I I started working with him about 20 years ago. And like you mentioned, I learned so much from him about the importance of the basics and everything happened on the show floor. Um, He dumped me on the show floor and he gave me an amazing opportunity for me to learn things on the show floor by do- learning by doing. And it's a very honor to for me to talk about him. Learning by doing, by the way, uh, I hope the listeners understand that to me, that's the only way you learn lean. Okay, you can read all the books. You know, I've written a couple books, uh, presentations, webinars. Doing it is a lot different than uh, than reading about it. And, uh, you know, you're not going to become a great golfer just by watching Tiger Woods. 
Yeah. Okay. You have to actually pick up the club and do it. Now that's a bad subject for me, by the way, because my golf <laughs> game needs. I don't even think Kaizen can help uh, my golf game. So, but yeah. anyway, that's an important part. I want to make sure we don't gloss over the doing part. And your father, in his method of teaching you, threw you on the shop floor and 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 basically had you do it and struggle yeah. and struggle. Yes. Right. So, yes. so you could tell us a little bit about your experiences with him and what kind of. What kind of what kind of mentor was he? What kind of sensei was he uh, to you? Yeah. Right. So when I started, I think, like I said, I was sort of dumped into the gamba without any pre training or special training, just because he was I was his son or something. I was on the shop floor and I was told that I need to implement standardized work and improve according to the standardized work. And the only thing I, he asked me is, can I use stopwatch and I said yes and that's the only <laughs> conversation I had before him is okay that's enough pick up your pencil go to the shop floor write down the standardized work improve it and that was the training methodology that uh, he did on me and he was doing to everybody everybody includes leaders right um, he didn't care the title of the job title of the person who he's talking to if he wants to train them to understand TPS or lean, they will bring them to the Gemba and say, okay, here, <laughs> you observe, maybe you might not go through the detailed stopwatch process, but what do you observe? And start the questioning starts there. And, you know, his, uh, how can I say, his consulting was always on the show floor and always sort of like walking around and not, necessarily following the presentations that he made. I know a lot of people prepare to present to him a lot of good stories, <laughs> but he will walk around randomly. And, you know, I, I think that's something that was, to me, it was surprising was like, um, he showed up on the shop floor suddenly, in many cases, without any prior <laughs> notice. And, you know, I, every time he comes by surprise, the condition is not necessarily perfect. And I used to Come make. Come on, are you, are you telling me that people prepare for shop tours? Come on, they don't. <laughs> they don't do five S before clean up, and I never yeah. saw that happen. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, and they paint the floor, and you know, suddenly you have a sunrise book posted when it was disappeared for. Oh, last I couple. love that. <laughs> hey, by the way, this is one of the reasons I don't like corporate audits on lean because oh, yeah. they're all fake and they're a waste of time anyway. I'm going to do a whole episode on that because that. Those audits are killers and they're political, but but I love that your father your father would just show up unexpected. Well, I hate to say this, but he did to that to me. Okay, well, yeah, I got a call. I think, yeah, I think, I think it's a standard practice that he, they do to people who they want to tra really train, and they yeah. just show up. And I I was also an, um, not a good student, so I tried to you know get his schedule from my mom or his. Oh, secretary. But, I see. But nobody tried to expose where he is because they know that you are not supposed to tell them where he is, and he is allowed to come anytime he wants to, and that's precious. And you know I used to make a lot of excuses. A lot of excuses why the machine is not running today. Oh, you know, we're not hitting the rate because of, you know, the, uh, the operators are not trained. Or... And I learned very early in my career that, that making excuses is the number thing that I can do, right? Uh, I shouldn't be making excuses. I should be finding a way to make it happen. And a lot of energy that a lot I think I used to spend is coming up with silly excuses. And he will always say, no. Son, that doesn't make sense. You know, you're on the game but more longer than me, but the timing that I can come is very rare. And then you're telling me this thing that's going on right now is very rare. It, are you saying that some kind of miracle is happening right now? How can it be yeah. rare? I come once yeah. uh, every three months and all of a sudden I saw this? Right, I see yeah. what he's saying. <laughs> he's a smart yeah. guy. Yeah, he is. <laughs> he is. And I, I, I have to say, I have no, you know, yeah, no logical excuse to that and i have to say yes sir i i totally agree with you um it's being shitty and i'm not doing my job to improve right because like he was the other thing he hates is like this war or bureaucracy or you know like okay you have a problem with machine why don't you bring the mentors people why don't you start bring the engineers work with them problem solve with them so that the machine go running if you have a problem with the supply chain, talk to the purchasing guy, talk to, you know, what's going on with the 
purchasing process and understand why we don't have the material today, problem solve it so that, you know, the problem disappears and don't just sit no, I wasn't sitting. I was just standing on the floor. I was just trying to do kaizens that I can, but focus on things that you need to do. And that was very eye opening. And he didn't care any, how can I say, organizational walls to make the shop flow better, the That's gamba great. better. That's right? great. And I, I was seeing him like crashing into human resource office and asking questions about training programs or crashing into, uh, what was it, the, oh, the quality team. You know? <laughs> I don't know how many times he just crashed in and grabbed the quality guy to come to the game and understand why we have so many digs and what is the quality control, what's the process here. And the quality manager can manage it, I mean, can answer it. And he's like, why you can answer it? This is your responsibility, right? It's, it's your job, not, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is not, your job is not looking at data and making fancy presentation. You're here on the show floor controlling quality. What are you supposed to be doing? And, and, and oh my God, it was so precious that, uh, how can I say, um, it's not just theory. He is theoretical, but he's not just theory. It's theory in practice. And that's what I think I, I learned a lot from him. So, so he he promoted a real sense of urgency to get things done, right? I mean, you know, I was told one time by one of my senseis, uh, when that machine goes down, pretend it's a life support equipment for one of your children. Are you going to fill out a maintenance work order and wait for maintenance to come? You know, and so uh, so the 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 story I have one of so he was working with us at Jake Break, uh, uh, he day and and. One day I was in my office and I got a call from the receptionist at the front desk. She said, uh, Jamie Oba is here to see you. And I go, really? I mean, I didn't know he was coming, right? <laughs> so, so I went down to greet him and he said to me, he had nobody else with him, okay? He, he said, I, I just want to walk through your factory and I don't need you to come, okay? Okay, so, okay, well, I'll just wait here. So I waited in the lobby. And what he did, I was watching him, he just walked around the factory, just once, just looking. And then he came back to the lobby and he said, okay, have a very nice day or something like that. And he left. And that was it. I would say he was there for, if it was 10 minutes, I'd be surprised. Okay. He came all the way in just to walk through the factory once and leave. And that was it. And Maybe he was testing our resolve that we were serious about this. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Like if he saw stuff that backslid, maybe that would tell him uh, they're not really serious about this. And by the way, there were things that backslid. Okay. We, we weren't, yeah, perfect, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. but I thought that was very interesting uh, how he did that, you know? Yeah. And I think I really love the word that you use, the sense of urgency that he wants to create within the organization it's yeah. really i think that's um sort of like symbolizes him like he implements pool system and you know just in time production systems and i remember this factory implemented that and it created a great amount of urgency and i remember like for example maintenance team came up with an amazing kaizen and you know they used to say oh we used to have 99 percent of the things accomplished but then after post system, they start saying, no, no, that's a bad thinking. It needs to be perfect, 100% all the time. We are very sorry that we haven't accomplished 99%. And now here, we are what we are doing in Kaizen to accomplish 100%. And they made a really good Kaizen and the whole team presented really well. And I thought my father would be happy about this whole change that happened through this just in time. And then he just whispered, I don't understand. I don't understand why the quality team is not panicking like the rest of the team. Wow. And he, and he left. After that, myself and the plant manager sort of look at each other. We went back to the Gemba to see what's going on around the quality inspection area. And we found out they, they are keeping secret inventories. And oh. Yeah, so even if they produce a lot of defect, right? They don't have to rush because the secret inventory will cover for the losses. The plant manager was like, okay, guys, <laughs> take it out. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not going to allow you guys to keep any more defect like this. I mean, safety stock for the losses of the quality issues. They are going to make a one red box here. One piece can go inside that. If the piece is there, you start problem solving. And, and, you know, and I was like so surprised, like, 
everybody was happy with the result and like you know celebrating the success of this just in time production or whatever you want to call it implementation but he was looking at hey the sense of urgency is not everywhere in the organization that's something is wrong and he just asked that one simple question and we didn't we didn't saw that it was behind the room and we didn't see it but oh my god he saw so it's it. almost like he had a sixth sense like he knew he knew his nose kind of got him there to say hey wait a minute something's going on here yeah he didn't know exactly what at the time but he knew where where you should look by asking that question well, that's, that's incredible you know i remember um the first time i ever um saw an example of value stream mapping was with your father. Yeah. And then after I learned it from him, then I saw what came out out of LEI. I was like, wait a minute, this is a Toyota guy. Okay. And, uh, and I know John Truck's Toyota and all that, but, um, but he took a, uh, he took a pen and on the top of a cardboard box, right in the middle of the shop, he was actually drawing it out for me. And, you know, and I, and I wish I had saved that piece of cardboard because to me, it's part of my, um, it's part of my history. You know, I don't have it, unfortunately. I didn't think back then. You know, a lot of times when you're doing this kind of stuff, you don't think you're making history or whatever. You're just trying to do something better. You're just trying to get better. And, you know, and, and I realized he was a special man. But as I grew through my career, I, I appreciated him even more. Uh, as I look back at his influence, you know, that he had. So maybe maybe a little bit about his demographic uh, background. Uh, 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 you, know, you know, he's he was from Japan. I know he traveled into Africa. He ended up becoming the head of the Toyota Supplier Support yep. Center in, I believe, Georgetown, uh, Kentucky, because that's where I inter interfaced with him because yep. we were supplying a part to Toyota at the time. Uh, not necessarily from Jake Break at the time, but we ended up being, and I, I ran the Asian business and I, I ran the Hino, the Hino Jake Break uh, to Japan. Of course, people may not know that Hino is part of Toyota. Uh, so anyway, uh, why don't you tell a little bit about how did he start and, you know, where did you guys grow up and, and, and all that kind of stuff? And by the way, did he make you do Kaizen at home too? I want to know that. <laughs> The answer is no to that question. I will talk about that later. That's but... good. That's good. Uh, yeah, so my dad was born 1945. Uh, so that's in the middle of the war. But uh, yeah, but I think he was born in the uh, Gifu prefecture. That is like north of the Dota city. And, you know, he grew up um, very close to the Toyota uh, area. Um, that's where his neighborhood, um, and actually where I was born, and also his high schools and everything was there. Um, he studied industrial engineering in Tokyo in a, uh, Waseda University, and I think he has a master's degree in industrial engineering, which is a very rare species in Toyota. Um, there are not many industrial engineers. There are a lot of mechanical engineers, but... Yeah, um, yeah. From early on from his life, he had some interest in this... Um, manufacturing field um actually my grandfather was operating a wood shop and maybe i don't know but maybe that's a family thing but we are all interested in this kind of thing and he joined toyota in 1968 or 9 i don't have the exact year um, most of the time early on in his career he was responsible for international production activities uh, especially he was responsible for the south african operations which was producing high aces and stuff. And this also means that from the early on from the carrier, he was responsible for translating uh, a lot of Toyota thinking to English, right? And oh, that's okay. One of, the, one of the interesting career paths that he had is from the beginning, he was translating a lot of TP, like TPS manual original version was translated. He was part of the team translating that to English. And uh, he was an expat to South Africa from 83 to 86. That's about time I remember really well, uh, but uh, because I'm already in elementary school. But he, and when he was an expat in at um, South Africa, he was responsible for the international production, which also includes like international supply chain. So he needs to find the suppliers to supply the South African operations. Uh, he was responsible for quality. 
And he was also responsible for TPS. And if I understand correctly, he did well, uh, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> and that's why the TPS picked him. And one interesting episode that I can share is that um, 20 years after 1986, we went back to South Africa. And he said, uh, you know, since we are in South Africa, let's visit the Toyota factory. And myself and my brother is practicing TPS. And he has two more boys. So four of us and other ones don't do TPS, but they are interested. So we say, okay, let's go as a family trip. And the whole, there was like old folks coming out to say, oh, what's that? oh his nickname was Dyson. So Dyson, nice to see. I can't believe no, no that. Kidding. Yeah. yeah. And when we walked on the floor, he saw that, you know, people are doing Kaizen report and activity was going on, but he really didn't. She started challenging those Japanese managers. Like, why are you guys are standing in front and not letting the locals sort of discuss and you know try to come up with ideas it's like oh, it's, it's, okay it's, the japanese is always criticizing the locals and he was challenging a lot of japanese people in the factory i mean i shouldn't say too much about that because um, he thinks he and that's one of his philosophy is we need to co-learn we we never consult we never teach we he might be asking question based on TPS thinking, but there's always something that you can learn from the locals that we should learn more about. Sure, and you should be open minded. So there's this partnership is he wants to see on the show floor, not necessarily the boss and the um, some subordinate sort of reporting the activity. There should be people thinking together, and that that was something I felt a little bit interesting because it's probably it was his unique capability why he was able to transfer tps in non-japanese environment it was he was sort of trying to create its core learning environment more often than you know i'm the teacher i'm the you the student kind of relationship and he was always trying to make us think for sure hey, so, do, you think, do you think the uh, kind of make an analogy here when you talked about your your experience with the quality manager have an extra inventory, okay, because of defects, there's an extra layer of waste in there, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think that that's the same concept with these middle managers not allowing the people who really know the work, the operators, to talk? In other words, it's it's a it's a level of, of interference, a level of waste. I'm not saying it's total waste, but, you know, are you hiding? Like, he, the quality person was hiding defects what are we hiding from your father in this case by not being able to talk to the operators? You see what I'm saying? The analogy I'm trying to make, you know? Yeah. 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 And, and that's why I think it's important for the shop floor people to take the, I think Akio Toyota recently said the return the sovereignty of to the shop floor. They yeah. should own it. They yeah. should speak up. Mm -hmm. And they should problem solve it, right? That's our responsibility. It's not like, oh, we have a problem and leave. We have a responsibility to fix it too and participate in that process. And creating that kind of environment is more important. It's a responsibility of the manager. I think that's what he, I think that's what he was trying to coach me is you don't have to criticize someone for not problem solving. It, it's our responsibility to provide the opportunity for people to think. And obviously, the tricky part is we are also responsible for the results. So you got to ask the question so that people will think the right way, right? Right. You can, yeah, you can say if people start saying, oh, we need to keep the safety inventory, the same reaction as a manager, there, then there's no value to it. You got to ask the question. And uh, so I think your, father, your father, your father then, you know, and I remember this of him, was the uh, use the Socratic method where by asking these questions, the learning is so deep, where if he just told you the answer, I'm sure he knew a lot of the answers. And it's hard for American managers today to hold back and not give their opinion of how things should be done. Even though they might be 5,000 miles away from the problem or five levels up, they try to give you the answer. And your father was trying to force people to think which is not something we normally do, especially in America. In America, we don't, we say we do, but we we don't really force, not force is the wrong word, 
provide the environment and framework for people to think, right? To be honest, I think if I remember what my father was saying, that's foreign in Japan too. Oh, okay. And, and I think it's the small group inside, uh, I would say Mr. Cho, Fujio Cho, the former president of TMNK, he was the guy that sort of started asking in more Socrates way. Like Ono's way was more sort of Zen, I, I would say. Like stand there in the circle. Yeah. There's no yeah. question. You just stand there and hopefully through observation, which I'm not saying it's a wrong methodology, but if for a beginner, it's, it takes a lot of time, right? And you might not get to the right conclusion faster. So I think it's Mr. Cho or somewhere around that generation in North America, they saw the Socrates method, um, especially like I know that they visited like Harvard Business School for the case study. And they saw how these people are organizing case studies and thought that that's a very good way of facilitating coaching. Yeah, and yeah. How can we do that on Gimba? Was one of the questions that my dad was always asking. And, and you know, he, my dad was working a lot with uh, Dr. Ken Boeing, who wrote the uh, Decode into your uh, DNA article. Yes, and I'm friends and, with Stephen Spear, by the way. We talk, we oh, can talk with each other. Yeah, yeah collaborate. Yeah, we collaborate. Yeah. Yeah, and I yeah, and I also meet with Stephen, and, and you know, through the exchange of thought, he, my dad and people of Toyota was looking at them as like, oh, wow, that's an interesting way of asking questions and, you know, facilitating the case study discussions. If we can do that on the short floor, this will become such a powerful yeah. coaching method. And I think that's a change that happened somewhere around. Like I said, it's a core learning, right? Toyota just didn't bring TPS to the United States. They learned something and they upgrading the TPS. Oh, sure. And I think that's the part that was a significant upgrade. And I, fortunate enough, uh, my I was on, right. My dad was on the frontier of that change, and that's why he tried the techniques to us. And that's why I thought that I like some of the Japanese old school guys. I don't want to say too much, but it's a little bit, you know, violent, or they might rush to the answer really quick. Directive. We stop yeah. thinking. Right, we just wait for the boss to give me the answer. Oh yeah, they're gonna be angry and noisy, but yeah, if you wait, you know that thunderstorm goes through, you will get the answer to it. But that's the difference and uniqueness of this group of people um, that happened on the, uh, I would say, from the late eighties to early nineties. Yeah. Well, you know, Fushio Cho, you know, we use his quote in our training uh, when we try to coach American leaders in that. Ask why, uh, go see, ask why, show respect, right? Mm -hmm. That's That was his mantra. And we quote him, uh, Fujio Cho, who was the ex-chairman of People Don't Know of Toyota. And uh, and and he, uh, he we use that. And one of the hardest things to do, uh, uh, Hide, Hide is, is to teach American leaders who got to their positions by knowing the answers to learn how to ask the right questions. It's so hard for them to do that because they want to weigh in and give their opinion and not let anybody. And then all people are then are just doers implementing somebody else's idea. Even if it's wrong, they may have the, the wherewithal to push back on a leader and say, Hey, well, no, no, we, I disagree because I really believe the further away that you get from a problem, in the organization, in the hierarchy of an organization, the 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 quality of the solution deteriorates. Okay, it's inversely uh, proportional. Quality of the solution to the level of the organization. So the closer you get to the shop floor and the people doing the work, to me, they're they're your best consultants. You know, and our job, I think, is to facilitate them and give them a framework to to win you know yes and i think the other other another area of what i learned from uh this mr cho's philosophy and my dad did the same thing is they don't how can i say they don't sat get satisfied with the experts opinion right uh -huh. challenging the experts too Right, and there's a famous episode of uh, I think Mr. Cho talked to the engineer and said the engineer responded back to him like, oh no no you cannot do that. 
Then Mr. Chota, okay. oh, thank you very much for your opinion. I will ask another engineer. <laughs> and, <laughs> and yeah, moved on. And eventually the engineer said, okay, so, okay, wait, hold on. Before you talk to a different engineer, let me rethink about it and I will come back and with a solution. And he did. And I think that's exactly how my dad would talk to any um, engineers is like, uh, I don't understand. You, you, I, I appreciate your expert opinion, but I have a doubt. It doesn't make sense on the short floor, so I will keep challenging you. And a lot of engineers who took the challenge will discover something very interesting and come up with a, yeah, so many processes disappear, or so many new way of doing a process come back. Well, you know, the, the one thing I always push back on is when somebody says, oh, Mark, he's an expert in lean. And, no, I'm not an expert. I'm, I'm a student. And, and, and I know that sounds like, okay, Mark, you just, you know, your virtual signaling here, you know? Um, and I can tell you right now, all of the things, there are many things in my career when I look back on that I thought were just the right things to do, especially as we, as I was architect of the, the construction of the Dana, her business system, some of the things I look back on and say, oh my goodness, you know, why did I do that? But back then I was convinced it was the way, okay? So, the older I get, the less I realize I don't know, you know, and and that's just like it comes with time, I guess, and wisdom. But you know, but it's, it, it's, it was a gift that your father had. So, so let me ask you a question about. So anyway, let's go on to TSSC. Then he went over yeah. to Kentucky and and uh, headed that up for how long? Yeah. So uh, in I think it was ninety one. Uh, President Bush came to Japan, and uh, one of the talk, trade talk was that you know um, you know stop exporting from Japan and move the operation to United States, but also disclose some of the TPS activities. And Terra thought about you know somehow contributing to the society, and they started this Terra Supply Support Center. Right. And, and my father was selected as the you know first, how can I call it, the CEO of Toyota Supplier Support Center mm -hmm. uh, to facilitate uh, TPS activities in US or in globally. Um, the funny story I know is that <laughs> back in the day, uh, you know, he was doing a lot of TPS seminars and a lot of people came. And I know that he used to use a hotel in Lexington, Kentucky. So once in a while, when we go back to Lexington, Kentucky, I told him, you know, you want to stay at the hotel that you used to do the seminars? And he go like, no, I don't want to go even close to that thing. <laughs> and I, I started asking him why. And he eventually he started talking about it because the back in those early 90s, right, the biggest complaint from the people who attended the seminar was they don't have enough red wines. Red wine? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the hotels, whatever, was not good and stuff like this. So, you know, it's completely different climate than today. I mean, right now, I think lean and TPS is getting some amount of respects. But back then, there were some people who didn't care about that thing. They come into the seminars because they can have a free vacation or whatever. Oh, boy. Fun. Now, having said that, there were a lot of people just like you who were interested in his work, and mm -hmm. there were, maybe, I would say, 50 50, or uh, you know, if there's 10 bad guys, there's 10 good guys. And you mm -hmm. know, eventually, a lot of people start contacting him, and you know, he asked, and um, they start asking for more consultants in the um, shop floor. And that's where I think he started working with a lot of. Uh, American companies, mainly with the business owners to implement TPS. Um, I know that Sammy Palmer's, Herman Miller's, uh, Hickory Chair, those, I mean, a lot of other places, Viking Range, a lot of owners worked with him. And also worked, he also worked with uh, like people like Paul O'Neill, um, uh, back the former president of uh, Alcoa. And also he was the Secretary of State, right? Uh, and um, and he started the hospital activity in Pittsburgh to implement TPS activity in hospital. And my dad was also involved with them too. Okay. So he started to get a lot of people that is serious about, and he started shifting away from sort of like doing seminars to shop floor consulting activities. And that's about time when I joined him. Well, I would say... I worked with him in the early 90s, okay? 
in uh, maybe 92, maybe 93, or maybe in that area. And I did, by the way, if it was always at the same hotel, then I did go to that hotel because I went to one of his seminars with, <laughs> with George Konensaker, um, who I worked for at the time. And uh, I remember one of the things in the seminar was kind of, this burns in my mind. We got into a, di uh, a discussion about Pokiok and Jidoka. And I had known, I'd known the difference. Uh, and I, 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 I put up my hand and I said, no, the difference between a Pokiok and a Jidoka is such and such, right? And I remember your father looked at me and he, he just shook his head like this, okay? And I was like honored that he did that, you know? Because, uh, you know, he acknowledged me and for somebody like that to acknowledge me was, and I was young then, you know, and, you know, back then we all thought we knew everything, you know, when you're young, you think you know everything. And, uh, and, uh, but in this case, I was right. <laughs> and uh, I remember him shaking his head in, in, in approval, you know, of explaining that. And, uh, and I, I'll remember that forever, you know, and, uh, but he, uh, so I had the opportunity, I think, to work with him in that regard, you know, the seminar type yeah. of, and also on the, you know, on the shop floor as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, that was, and he had two people that worked with him that came in to help us. I remember one lady name was Rachel, and I can't remember the other guy's name, but, uh, but I, so for some reason, I remember her name and uh, they were very good and they helped us and they were focused on a component area. Mm -hmm. So we we had housings and housing lines, one piece flow, U shaped, and all that standard work, the whole thing. But the components area they really wanted to focus on because I think they saw that was the the heart and soul of our business. If we didn't get that one right, then none of the other parts of the company worked right. And uh, they spent a lot of time there in doing a lot of data analysis and understanding you know, machine cycle times and you know setup times and and things like that. So anyway, it was. It was uh, the, the the level of scrutiny and detail that they went into was far greater than we ever did, you know. And it's a detailed game; it, it really is. But it, it was it was quite a quite an experience for me. So yeah, and I, I think he how can I say he wants to pay attention to the detail, not necessarily the data, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, it, it does. Yeah, I'm mean, paying attention to the detail doesn't mean generating more data and analyzing the data itself it's 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 about more about the fact of you know what's cycle time for this co particular component what's the differences and yeah 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 um, i think he had people to do that for him you know because he right, was right. Really held our feet to the fire on the principles you know yeah. and, and making sure that we we're we we're pure there you know because you're right data by itself means nothing you know uh so let me let's kind of shift a little bit over to uh, him as a person, you know. So, you know, I know a lot of uh, a lot of the Japanese consultants that I worked with, primarily with Shinga Jitsu, and they were our mentors, and you know, we think very highly of them. But they were tough on us, you know, they were tough on us. But they did use the Socratic method quite often, which was frustrating. But I still remember the lessons learned from them because of that. If they had told me the answer on Monday, I would have forgotten it by now. But on Thursday night at 2 a.m. in the morning when I wake up in a cold sweat with the answer finally hit me, right? Those lessons you 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 keep forever, right? And and I knew they knew the answer, but they wanted me to figure it out, you know. But your father, so was was he when when he was with you in business versus like your father at home, was he different? What was his personality like, you know? Uh, did he make you five vest your room? Uh, <laughs> you know? No, uh, it's, it's very different. I would say I five vest his room. <laughs> oh, you did. Yeah, he, his room was such a mess, and he has so many stuff, paper. Oh, that's, oh, that's funny. From you know all kind of sources, it was so valuable that I did five vest, and I still keep them. And I think I keep the database of the, his office and I have better knowledge of what's going on inside his office than oh, he did. Funny. Yeah. And there are a lot of good materials there. So I don't want to throw away and I understand the value. Sure. Do sure. yeah. you ever so, think that yeah. he, made it, he kept it that way for you as a test for you? 
<laughs> I know he tried to clean it, but he 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 didn't. Uh, I, yeah, I I I I don't know. I think it's it's a good lesson for me. I mean, I I'm learning as I organize. Right? There's a lot of do document. I think I saw one of the Donna book by the way, in the library. Um, she oh, you did? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And uh, yeah, but, you know, I can go through and understand these contents. But now I went through shop floor with him. I understand what those documents means, right? Sometimes like, the doctor makes the worst patient, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, yeah. Uh, so in the personal side, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think he was a good... <laughs> Now I remember I remember him as uh, on the shop floor. He wasn't really one to get angry, or you know, he was very economical in his words. You know, he, he what he said though was very powerful, right? And uh, he seemed like a very uh, uh, I wouldn't say mellow is not the right word, but very tranquil. You know, in terms of how he thought about things and how he carried himself. I, I never, you know. At least the time I worked with him, I never saw him get angry or anything like that. Uh, but he was very, you know, like I said, whatever he said had a lot of weight and a lot of meaning because it wasn't wasted words. Yeah, um, I've seen him getting angry uh, once in a while, but 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 but, but the, I think he got angry like multiple times to me. But I know when uh, he will get angry. One is that. I commit to doing a Kaizen and I didn't. I come up with the inferior, uh, you know, lower level idea. Uh, and I got in deep, deep trouble a couple of times about that, which I truly appreciate that. Um, I, I, mm -hmm. And the other one is when I don't respect the people. Like uh, some mm -hmm. attitude, right? Like putting your hands in the pocket or like I'm doing time study and leaning myself to something and he will get really upset about wow. that. Is that um, show your respect to the people, workers? And back then, I was, you know, young, twenty, whatever, whatever, whatever person I was. Too right. When you were that young, you you knew everything just like I did. Yeah, right. right. Just out of college, I thought I knew everything about. Oh, sure. Very and, and, and yeah, I didn't understand what how hard that job that I was observing was, and I didn't show that respect. And he was not. He was he had zero tolerance, and I didn't seem that angry at home. So when those basic principles are broken, he will get really upset about it. And I think it's a fair, you know, comment. I, I appreciate it that, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, again, you're his son too. So, you know, if you were to say, well, he never got angry with me, I would say, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> There's no yeah. son and father relationship that anger didn't happen one time or another, right? Uh, but, uh, well, this is great. This is, you know, to give him a little bit of honor, I wanted to bring you on and talk about your father because he was part of my, my, uh, uh, DNA, if you will. <laughs> okay. And, uh, it was an honor to have worked with him. My, my only regret was, I wish I could have worked with him more. Uh, but you know, the times I did have an interface with him was, uh, was really rewarding. And, uh, I was, you know, honored honor to do so so and he passed away at, on what date uh, he uh september for a third night 2020 so 2020. about so just just a couple of years ago yeah a couple yeah. of years yeah. yeah yeah well it's too bad and uh you know I'm, i hope this uh this podcast can uh at least uh continue his memory and legacy uh going on and I think this is going to lead us into the next podcast, uh, and next episode, I should say, episode 31, uh, which we're going to talk about the lean basics. You and I had a very good conversation a couple of weeks ago about the basics of lean and how we are moving away from our basics. So your father had a lot of influence in you in, in instilling basics, as he did with me and others as well. And the more we see, uh, you know, us deviate the more frustrating guys like you and me get and uh, <laughs> uh so but uh so any last words about your dad uh would you like yeah, to say yeah, yeah yeah well first of all thank you very much for this opportunity and the time sure. and maybe one last quote that i i really like when he when he said this a lot and and what the thing he said is like respect people people have a limited life so don't waste their time Respect the um, humanity, 
we have unlimited humanity and we always do Kaizen to sort of you know develop and deploy this humanity. And I think that's his philosophy. And I think he really meant that. And yeah, sometimes he's very technical, but at the in the end, he always talking about human humanity, human and humanity. So I, I and I really like that word. I think that's the reason why we do Kaizen, right? We should respect the people's time. We should they shouldn't be wasting. And every people have unlimited capabilities, so we should develop them. And I think he he spent his life committing this philosophy. And I, I really appreciate this opportunity to talk about him. And thank yeah. you very much. Oh, no, no, no problem. And by the way, uh, I do think, and maybe we'll talk about this next on the next uh, episode, but you know, the, one of the more disrespectful things I think leaders can do is not give... Uh, employees the opportunity and framework in which to to grow and to solve problems and and use their brain and uh and and to your point waste your time so when you're working in a very um uh, chaotic business chaotic processes and then the then the leader says well we don't have time to make improvements because we're too busy fighting fires <laughs> When, when are you going to get out of that cycle, you know? And uh, it's a total disrespect to the operator. Even judoka, the notion of judoka based on RFP, I respect for people, you don't want an operator standing there watching the machine all day. That's disrespectful of not only their time, but it's a boring job. And, you know, you wouldn't stand in front of your clothes dryer washing your clothes dry, right? Yep. Um, yep. So, although my dog does, uh <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but anyway, you wouldn't do that, right? You you, yeah. would, you would you would move on and do something else, right? So uh, and be more productive in that regard. So yeah. and then, by the way, to demand performance out of people when the processes are so messed up, you know. But anyway, we'll talk more about that on the next episode. So uh, Hajima Oba is uh, who we're talking about, and he was a uh, you know an influence on me, and I'm sure countless others, including. Um, he, 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 they, I'm yes. sure he was a definite influence on you yes. and again, he, he, they, you are a senior consultant with H and M operations management out of New York city. Yes. Is that your website? H and M operations management.com. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. That's the website. H and M operations management.com. If you want real pure lean as it's, as it was designed to, to be, uh, uh, Hide is a guy you need to call uh, because he can, he, he, you know, I mean, he's, he's got the lineage right back to uh, TPS and uh, uh, how, how can you get better than that? Unless we can somehow resurrect Tashiono. I don't think we could do that. Uh, or your dad. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, by the way, do you think that they're up in heaven doing Kaizen up there or what? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, well, he's uh, probably not happy. <laughs> yeah, I'm making much progress. <laughs> I have some homework to do. And that's homework is really into basics. So, you yeah. know, yeah, I, I, I still have a lot of things to do. And I'm quite sure he's uh, up there with them, with yes. the masters. Yes. But, uh, he will be particularly young one in the mix. So I think he needs to explain to them why he broke the sequence. <laughs> ah, okay. Well, I'm sure there'll be, if I know anything about them, they'll appreciate that. So, you know, okay. Well, very good. Thank you. We're going to, this is episode 30, lean911.com uh, is where you can find all of this. Also on Apple Podcast and Spotify and all the other platforms. And this will be on YouTube as well. So, uh, Hide, thank you. And we'll see you on the next episode. Thank you very much, Mark. Thanks for listening to the Lean 911 podcast. I'll be happy to address your questions or feedback on future episodes. Email me at mark at lean911.com. You can check out our other episodes by visiting our website at lean911.com, our YouTube channel, wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Mark DeLuzio. Thanks for listening.